Middle Earth Shadow of War is a perfect sequel. That does not make it a perfect game, far from it. But every single element of its predecessor has been refined, iterated on, or forged anew. The gameplay is stronger, the world is more expansive, the orcs are more varied than ever. The story is… still not very good? But at least better than the last one. In Shadow of War, you play as generic human ranger Talion, banished from death and merged with the elf lord Celebrimbor, and must use your wits, your weapons, and your warped sense of justice to engage in high profile acts of domestic terrorism on the local population. Your reign of terror is long, dark, and terrible. These are orcs. Evil, hilarious orcs. But how much of this do they deserve? How far can you go? And just how far is too far? Uh, enough! Kill me! Just end it. No. The previous game, Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, released in 2014, was a surprise hit. I went in expecting an Assassin's Creed ripoff, Requiascat in Pace. Bitch. But then the game just hit me with surprise after surprise. The plot starts moving right away and you're dumped into the open world to fend for yourself. Batman combat? Okay. Andy Serkis's Gollum voiced by someone who is not Andy Serkis? Piss off Serkis, you stupid fat with a f***ing turd! I'm, I'm not fat. And damn, Mordor looks like that? Suffice to say, it blew my expectations away. But the biggest surprise of all was the famous, or should I say, infamous Nemesis system. The Nemesis system is a game mechanic so good that the bastards had it protected by law and then never used it again. So what exactly is the Middle Earth series? It's an open world action game set in the Lord of the Rings universe. Shelob is hot now, a real hector edger. Just roll with it. Looking back on it, I have no idea how my silky smooth nine-year-old brain managed to sit through The Fellowship of the Ring, a three-hour movie, multiple times a week, on a bootleg VHS with hard-coded Chinese subtitles that skips the opening monologue. It's testament to how rich and engaging the world and characters are, and definitely not because watching Aragorn face down a hundred Urukai put hair on my chest. The films prove that The Lord of the Rings, by its own nature, is difficult to faithfully adapt into other mediums. Even when the books were adapted and condensed into the Peter Jackson films, they were still filled with so many references to events in the books that I could only appreciate as an adult. Shadow of War, however, makes no attempt to overcomplicate its story with scores of characters and it certainly doesn't even attempt to be faithful to the source material if the source material does not serve their vision. There is some strange stuff going on in this version of Middle Earth. And to say it's strange is really saying something in a world that has already established Gondor as being in the late medieval period, whilst the hobbits look like they're two weeks out from inventing guns. I'm talking orcs raising the dead, renegade Chinese Nazgul, ancient Numenorean Batman technology, and of course, stupid sexy Shelob. The broad strokes of the world are present, but the references are deep in the background, usually relegated to collectibles. Anything that doesn't serve the main quest line is left out, or at best, only hinted out. It's also non-canon if that helps a Tolkien nerd sleep at night. It won't. But I came here for a video game, and a video game I got. The gameplay is primarily a mixture of stealth, rolling, and guerrilla terror tactics. Stealth is typically used to thin the herd with traps, sabotage, and assassinations. It's ridiculously fast-paced, with enemies giving you a generous window between the time they see you and the time it takes their neurons to finally activate. You have a plethora of tools and abilities to silently, yet loudly, wipe out the outer defences of an enemy outpost. Then when you inevitably trip up and the alarm is sound, the real combat begins. Combat is the same flurry of attacks, parries, dodges and stuns made famous in the Batman Arkham games. Luckily for me, I didn't burn myself out on the entire Arkham series, so this style of combat has always remained appealing to me. It's simple enough to pick up, and slowly increases in challenge as you gain more abilities and meet new enemy types. Also, it looks pretty damn cool. Enemies come at you by the dozens, and you slaughter them by the thousands. You control Talion while harnessing Celebrimbor's wraith powers. These powers include a hitscan bow, a glaive, a stun, and like a hundred other things. It truly is a sight to behold as Talion and Celebrimbor work in perfect synchronicity to dispatch their foes. In the previous game, Talion and Celebrimbor slowly built up a repertoire of skills and abilities over the course of the story. Then, at the beginning of Shadow of War, they are all taken away in one of my most hated gaming tropes. <laughs> Thankfully you gain most of these abilities back pretty quickly, then go on to gain in power from there. But of course, as you grow in power, 
so too do your enemies. You may think you're pretty fly, white boy, until the orcs start firing explosive arrows, teleporting, cursing you, shadow clone jutsuing you, and doing a whole manner of things that would have driven Christopher Tolkien insane. As the enemy captains move up the Mordor food chain, they gain new abilities, new equipment, and higher stats. Sometimes, that makes the fights tedious if you're up against a foe with a massive health bar and some bullshit ability that lets them fully regenerate after you defeat them. But more often than not, they'll actually become more interesting. Failing from time to time may just improve your experience. Maybe they'll gain a new mount, an entourage of new followers, or even a hype man. Look at him! He's so angry he can't even talk! He's going to enjoy tearing you apart! One of the game's main draws is the open world, and by god does Shadow of War do it well. Instead of the two open world hubs of the first game, we have several distinct regions that are big, but not too big. Large enough to feel like a vast swath of land, but not so huge as to make travelling tedious. There's Minas Ithil, the city under siege, the frozen wastes of Seragost, the volcanic plains of Gorgroth, the coastal forests of Nernan, the cavernous region of Kirathungal, and the desert plains of Lithlad. It's almost overwhelming, and each of these regions has its own fortress, set of outposts, and an army to contend with. However, the narrative weaves through each of these regions like a drunken toddler on a tightrope. God help you if you want to follow each quest thread independently. You'll be going back and forth, round and round, until the repetitiveness brings you to the brink. One quest has you hunt the same captain across every region to rescue an ally, but every time you show up he'll slip away and then you quick travel to the next region and oh my god, Shadow of War, why are you so hard to love? But then I remember them. The boys. <laughs> What's good for you? Look out! Ah, look out! Merc and I are more than head twins. We are two halves of the same orc. That's why they said we were special. Right out of the vat, they said it. Twice the intellectual prowess, twice the cunning, and twice the intimidating yet noble visage. I am the Uruk Bard. A worthy foe is hard. Defied. You cleave me in two. Any other orc would have died, but I survived. More than that, I thrived. My brothers put me back together, stronger than ever. But they didn't make me into what I am. You did. You created the machine. Little Mousy's about to get his airy foot in a rat trap. Bold words for a filthy orc son of Mordor. The orcs and ologs of Mordor are what elevate this game to heights it otherwise wouldn't deserve. They are sort of randomly generated, meaning that they are randomly assigned a name, a nickname, and various traits which dictate their personality. They have their own strengths, like being immune to fire, for example, or weaknesses such as being vulnerable to stealth. On top of that, they have things they fear and things they hate. Maybe they're deathly afraid of being poisoned, and by poisoning them you can cause them to flee the battlefield. Or maybe acrobatics is one of their pet peeves, and by doing so you'll send them into a blind rage in which they'll become stronger and more reckless. But the best part of the Nemesis system is that they remember their previous encounter with you and mention it upon your next meeting. Ranger walk back into my throne room. Another try for fort. Careful not to slip in blood you left before. They grow and change across the course of the game. You can slash, blast, or shoot them to death. But then they'll come back to tell you what a moron you are for thinking that a low-yield nuclear explosion would be enough to finish them off for good. You can disfigure an orc gradually over the course of the game until they practically beg you to kill them. It's an experience you'll never forget. And there are so many variations that you'll almost never see the same one twice, unless you do online vendettas. Do not do online vendettas. You will see the tower in every single one. In Shadow of Mordor, the first region had you battling the occupying orc army, and the second region had you forcibly mind controlling them and recruiting them into your own army. The mind control worked by beating them to a pulp and having Celebrimbor go full wraith mode on them. Sounds cool, right? Wrong. In the first game, the act of mind controlling orcs pretty much lobotomized them. Their endearing personality? Gone. The rivalry? Erased. All of that rapport you've built with them vanishes the instant you recruit them to your side. But Shadow of War fixed it. Those mad lads actually pulled it off. Now you can have glorious tales of rivalry and friendships. Ambushes, rescues, betrayals. The list goes on. You can defeat an orc, refuse to execute them, and instead drive them into insanity. You can do some messed up stuff to the boys. And I know orcs are literally the spawn of pure malice, and are considered by many to be irredeemable, but these boyos are so endearing. <laughs>
Bloods! Bloody bloods! Bloody bloods! Bloody! They're hilarious and have excellent comic timing. It's rare for their personalities to actually feel threatening, but carelessly die to them enough times and they'll become a real threat. Time marches on after you die. The captains get stronger, gain better weapons, recruit bodyguards and become harder to reach. Run away from a fight and the same thing will happen anyway. Mordor's hierarchy is a violence-based economy and there's no way to avoid partaking in it. They will become stronger if left unchecked. You just need to decide which targets are worth the risk. This is where Shadow of War is at its best. You can't always beeline straight to an enemy captain to take their head. Sometimes you need to be slow, meticulous, and smart, only to watch your plans unravel the moment your nemesis suddenly shows up to avenge his blood brother. The Mordor hierarchy across each region is the same. You have the captains at the bottom, noteworthy orcs and ologs who are constantly fighting amongst themselves. Then there are the war chiefs. These are captains who have proven themselves well enough to gain an outpost to control, and maybe even a few captains as bodyguards. Then finally, the big boys. The overlords. Each region has an overlord occupying the fortress. They are guarded by their war chiefs, who are in turn guarded by their captains. And to have any chance of defeating any of these foes, you'll need to learn about them, pick off their bodyguards, ambush them during a pub crawl, turn their allies against them, and draw them out of hiding. All of these systems eventually coalesce into this game's pièce de résistance, the siege battles. These events are where the skills you've learned, the followers you've recruited, and the enemies you've made all converge to produce some of my most memorable gaming moments. You're not taking one more step into this fort. We're going to cut you down, eat what's left over, and turn you into a steaming pile of shrack. Are we going to threaten to kill him or kill him? Siege battles involve assigning your captains to the assault or defense party and purchasing upgrades for them to bring into battle. For example, the attackers can purchase higher tier infantry, caragors that can scale walls, and suicide bombers that can... Defenders, on the other hand, can buy boiling pitch to melt attackers, break the Rivendell conventions with chemical warfare, or buy a really big door. The aim of the siege is simple. As a defender, you'll have to outlast the waves of enemy captains that throw themselves at you. Kinda lame, but also kinda difficult too. Still, it can be quite cinematic watching everything crumble around you, and then having to rebuild your forces in order to retake the fort is a pretty interesting journey the first time. But taking a fort is a lot more fun. It's a multi-tiered battle that starts with your forces needing to breach the walls, then capture the control points, before finally dueling the ruling overlord. The emergent stories that come out of these battles are beautiful. I feel honoured to fight and die with my orc brethren. But holy shit guys, please stop killing each other before the battle even begins. So how about that story, huh? Uh... The important thing to know is that somehow Sauron has returned, and the orcs now control Mordor. Previously in Shadow of Mordor, Talion, a ranger of the Black Gate, is murdered with his family, but bonds with a wraith to cheat death. That wraith turns out to be Celebrimbor. No. Not that Calibrimbor. Come closer. This Calibrimbor. <laughs> Calibrimbor is the elf who helped forge the Rings of Power. Through this bond, Talion is neither dead nor alive. Mechanically, it means that if you die, then you respawn after a certain length of in-game time. My favourite part of the story is that Talion and the rest of the world acknowledges this. Talion's in a tight spot? Mm, let me just help you out there. Talion and Celebrimbor don't know that the Fellowship will eventually defeat Sauron. They just know that something has to be done. So they are willing to die again and again and again just to take their shot at destroying the Dark Lord. The other part I love about the story is that although elves in Middle-earth are often depicted as graceful, almost angelic beings, Celebrimbor is a real son of a bitch. He's cold, pragmatic, untrustworthy, and maybe a teeny bit insane. He's already fought and lost against Sauron, so he's really unsympathetic to how much pain Talion has to go through to get his revenge. Unfortunately, aside from the orcs, Talion and Celebrimbor are pretty much the only interesting characters the game has. Before replaying the game recently, I uh, didn't remember any of these characters. They are absolutely forgettable. All I remembered was Talion, Celebrimbor, DLC Man, Thirst Trap Shelob, Ratbag, Bruce, and Gollum. Yeah! 
Anvil sucks! The story in Shadow of War is delivered poorly. I mean, the production values are great, the voice acting is so good, but how they funnel their ample resources into such inconsequential and meaningless activities is just a bit depressing. There's also a disconnect between the story and the open world. The game's story is dead serious, but then it will throw on a walking, talking, finding Nemo reference and have the audacity to call the first orc I met douche. Douche. Story missions are ridiculously low effort. It's almost tragic how much potential they squander. For example, I see an orc archer at the end of this cavern trying to snipe me, so I use Shadow Strike to close the gap. After propelling myself across the cavern, I instantly fail the mission because I strayed too far from my allies. What the hell? But most of the time it's more like, oh boy, after waging war on an orc fortress and fighting tooth and nail alongside my trusted allies, seeing the chaotic battlefield full of death, destruction and betrayal, sure, I'd love to slowly follow an NPC around until I release some prisoners. And that's all you do in these missions. Just follow and rescue, follow and rescue, follow and rescue. And then if the level designers were feeling particularly frisky that day, they'll rip out one of your orc acquaintances and set them as a boss character. That's about all you get. And it makes no sense to me. It seems so easy to improve. Rescue prisoners? Sure. I can do that. Make that mission start a little ways away instead of 10 meters away from the objective. And let my plans get organically disrupted by the roaming orc captains. But what is this story I keep whining about? It's actually a pretty good setup. After realizing in the previous game that they are effectively immortal, Talion and Celebrimbor decide to forge a new ring to fight against Sauron. This one is blue. It was some lame sequel bait that I rolled my eyes at when it happened at the end of the first game, but good golly did they commit to it for the sequel. I'm not going to get into any more detail than that. It's a story that starts strong, does nothing spectacular, and then ends brilliantly. Despite its shortcomings, I have to commend Monolith. It would have been so easy for them to end the game with Talion looking directly into the camera and saying, we have finally overcome the shadow of war, but the time has come for a newer ring, and got to work making a green ring or something. But they didn't and I'm so happy about that. But just because the campaign ended doesn't mean that was the end. There were two story expansions set concurrently during Shadow of War's endgame, and they got weird with it. My lady, I have searched every corner of Mordor for you. Ever since I first heard the stories of an elf that burned with the brightness of a sun, I never imagined you would be so... so in... Jumping. Oh. The Blade of Galadriel follows Eltariel's own terror campaign through Mordor and her hunt for two rogue Nazgul. The idea of rogue Nazgul is a problem in of itself, considering the Ringwraith's defining trait is that they are slaves to Sauron in the One Ring, but Whatever. They also come from ancient China, so we are deep into Monolith's fanfiction now. Not a great story, but it has its moments. Eltariel is just like Talion, but with a few slightly different powers. Of course, due to it being a DLC with a much lower budget, the randomly generated orcs and ologs are toned down. But to compensate for that, the orcs and ologs in the story are quite silly. Too silly. The second expansion was the Desolation of Mordor, featuring Baranor, the Haradrim turned Gondorian captain of Minas Ethel, as he raises a mercenary army to take an orc fortress in Lithlad. Unlike Blade of Galadriel, Desolation changes up the formula. This one's a time trial. You don't have Talion's ability to respawn. Baranor is a mortal man, and dying in the game means that you die in real life. Baranor also has a different moveset and equipment that sets him apart from Talion and Altariel. It's actually pretty good. You take outposts and hire Easterling mercenaries to work as your bodyguards. The mercenaries you recruit are half-baked, of course. This is still just a DLC after all, but they are a welcome addition even if they are just reskinned orcs. The story is more light-hearted and entertaining and doesn't overstay its welcome. All in all, a pretty fun time. Bet you're glad you hired me! Despite my love of the series, I do have some unreasonable complaints. The bad? It's not enough. I want more. I need more entries in the series, and they certainly don't have to be set in Mordor. Just give me more, goddammit! There are a lot of things that Shadow of War does wrong. The story meanders throughout most of its runtime, the well-acted characters are wasted on a plot that doesn't really ask that much of them, the loot upgrades are so incremental that it's impossible to feel excited at the pieces of gear you collect, and they don't even appear in cutscenes. And on release, the endgame had an awful grind to see the final cutscene, which has thankfully been patched out since, along with the microtransactions. But for everything it fails at, it still produced some of the highest highs I've ever felt in gaming. If you and I played the game side by side, we'd both finish the game with different allies, different enemies, and different stories to tell about them. The Nemesis system was a gift from God, and we are squandering it. 
If Monolith was able to improve it so drastically after just one sequel, imagine what they could achieve with the next one. Better yet, imagine if the bastards didn't block everyone else from using it. Imagine the stories that could be told in other games, and in other worlds. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I really appreciate it. See you next time. Say, Monzo! Say, Monzo! Go f*** yourself!